Call to order the Society's 2,475th meeting in what is now the 152nd year since its founding on March 13, 1871. Good evening, everyone. So my name is Larry Milstein. I'm the president of PSW, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members, guests, and friends, including everyone here in the Palo Auditorium at the Cosmos Club, and everyone tuning in on YouTube to tonight's lecture by Jonathan Losos. The Society is grateful to the PSW Full Year Series sponsors, PSW Mike Helton and Helton Associates, and the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University. We're also grateful to PSW Spring Lecture Series sponsor, PSW member Tim Thomas, and to the sponsor of tonight's lecture, the estate of longtime PSW member Marvin, Marvin Haas, who passed away last year. Please join me in thanking them all for sponsoring PSW's activities. Speaking of sponsors, as mentioned at the last few min meetings, the Society has been conducting a fundraising campaign. Uh, we are facing increasing costs for the Cosmos Club and just about every other service that we use. I'm pleased to report that we have reached our goal for this fiscal year of $25,000 above last year's dues, contributions, and sponsorships primarily due to full year series and individual lecture sponsorships by generous donors. We will be looking uh, with hope that the society will have the same level of support for the coming fiscal year when we expect that cost will unfortunately again increase. If you want PSW to continue activi its activities and remain a vibrant organization, please contribute to its financial support. Please see me if you are interested in becoming a contributor or send an email to our corresponding secretary at corresponding sec at pswscience.org. I am pleased to announce the following new member, tonight's speaker, Jonathan Losos, who learned of PSW from the invitation to speak here tonight and whose interests will be clear in no small part from tonight's lecture. We welcome him to membership. If you're not a member, please join now. You can do so quite easily using the blue join button on the home page of the PSW website, www.pswscience.org. The requirement is a genuine interest in science and a willingness to pay the annual dues. All members are entitled to wear the PSW Science Rosette. The rosettes are $15 plus 90 cents DC sales tax. They can be purchased online or at the rosette table in the back. They must be picked up at a lecture at the Cosmos Club. We will not mail them to you because we are not going to keep track of the sales tax that will be due wherever you happen to reside. Recording Secretary Camille Lance cannot be here in person, but she has kindly provided a recording of her reading of the minutes of the 2474th meeting and the lecture by Walter Harris on comets, centaurs, and trans-Neptunian objects exploring the echoes of formation in the outer solar system. On March 17, 2023, from the Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., and by Zoom webinar broadcast on the PSW Science YouTube channel, President Larry Milstein called together the 2,474th meeting of the Society to order at 8.02 p.m. He welcomed new members, and the recording secretary read the minutes of the previous meeting. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, 
Walter Harris, Chief Scientist at the University of Arizona Space Institute. His lecture was titled, Comets, Centaurs, and Trans-Neptunian Objects. Harris began the lecture by exploring the echoes of formation in the outer solar system. He discussed his research on the structure of thin atmospheres, their transition to and interactions with the space environment, and the formation of the solar system. Harris then provided an outline for this lecture. Beginning with the formation of planetary systems, he would then discuss the late stages of forming the planetary system and the role comets played in the process, and the nuclei of the comets, which are different from the ball of gas and tails visible from Earth. Harris delved into the limitations of observing comets and explained how comets are formed. One way comets are formed is through a process called accretion, which is where small particles such as dust and gas accumulate over time to form larger objects. Another way comets are formed, Harris explains, is through a process called gravitational collapse, which occurs in areas of high density in a disk of gas and dust. In these areas, there is enough gravity to cause the gas and dust to collapse in on itself forming small objects that can eventually grow into comets. The speaker mentioned that Uranus and Neptune appear to be planets made entirely of comets and that there is a planet 300 times the mass of the Earth and several others in the outer solar system that have large gravitational imprints on small comets. The speaker went on to, to explain the characteristics of different types of comets, by plotting their orbital inclination, eccentricity, and their distances. He pointed out that comets with very large separations from the sun have no particular inclination and are isotropic. Those in close pr proximity to the sun have reasonably small orbits of 20 to 100 years and are mostly close to the ecliptic plane. Harris then explained that objects with spherical incoming distribution have very long periods and come from very far away. Almost halfway to the nearest star, he emphasized. Short, periods, short period comets with orbital periods of 20 years or less are called Jupiter family comets. These orbits are phased with Jupiter. Long period comets with orbital periods of more than 200 years are rarely seen more than once, he noted. The speaker then discussed the composition and identification of comets and their properties. He mentioned that comets are typically weak and have no cohesion, which causes them to break apart easily. He gives examples such as Comet shoemaker Levy 9 which broke apart when it had a close approach to Jupiter. He also talked about Comet 1995 Schwassmann Walkman, which broke apart but did not dissipate and continues to orbit the sun as individual fragments. The speaker suggests that comets are rubble piles consisting of individual comets put together. Harris then discussed spacecraft missions to visit comet nuclei and mentioned that six have been visited so far. Next, the question and answer period began. One member asked, what is a non-gravitational force in relation to comets, and how does it make it difficult to predict their orbits? Hearst responded that when comets lose mass, they behave like a rocket and constantly change their position, making it difficult to predict their orbit. This phenomenon is called non-gravitational force. Another member asked why shoemaker Levy 9 formed a long train of objects when it fragmented, while other comets, like Hartley 2, fragmented into little pieces that stayed together. Harris responded by explaining that the long train of objects was in the direction in which everything was going for, uh, for Shoemaker 9, and that it has to do with the extent of tidal forces that were pulling it apart. However, comets like Hartley 2 are very close to the sun and quite active, so there are a lot more non-gravitational forces which split the objects into different areas, but they are all still very close to the original orbit. After the question and answer period, 
President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. President Milstein adjourned the meeting at 9.51 p.m. Temperature in Washington, D.C. was 14 degrees Celsius. The weather was cloudy. Respectfully submitted, Cameo Lance. Are there any comments, corrections, or additions to the minutes? I believe there's one from the back of the room, which would be the attendance. Uh, can Robin tell us what the attendance was? Okay, well, I have it in an email, but I can't get to it, so uh, the minutes will be posted to the website in, in due course, subject to your approval, and I will be adding the attendance uh, at that time. Uh, do I have a motion to accept the minutes subject to that addition? A second? All in favor? All opposed? Minutes are accepted, subject to that one addition, and will be posted to the website. We now turn to tonight's lecture by Jonathan Losos on using experiments in nature to study evolution, research on lizard island adaptations in real time. Jonathan is the William H. Danforth Distinguished University Professor in the Department of Biology at Washington University, and he is Director of the Living Earth Collaborative, a partnership between Washington University, the St. Louis Zoo, and the Missouri Botanical Garden to advance knowledge of biodiversity. Previously, he was Professor of Biology and Curator in Herpetology at Harvard University and the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology. He is an author on more than 240 papers, editor of several academic volumes on evolutionary biology, and an author of several books, including two leading college textbooks, as well as books for general audiences, including Improbable Destinies, The Future of Evolution, and his latest book to be published in May, The Cat's Meow, How Cats Evolved from the Savannah to Your Sofa, if you happen to own a cat. Among many other honors and awards, Jonathan is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He received the Dobzhansky Prize of the Society for the Study of Evolution, the E.O. Wilson Naturalist Award of the American Society of Naturalists, the Elliott Medal of the National Academy of Sciences, and the Distinguished Herpetologist Award of the Herpetologist League. Jonathan earned an A.B. in Biology at Harvard and a Ph.D. in Zoology at UC Berkeley. All questions will be fielded after the question and answer. I'm sorry, will be fielded after the lecture during the question and answer session. Jonathan, the stage is yours. Well, thank you, Larry, for that very nice uh, introduction, and uh, I'm delighted to become a member of the, of the Philosophical Society of Washington. I did not realize that that was part of the arrangement here, so uh, welcome to me to this organization. I'm very pleased to, to be a member. So uh, thank you for coming out tonight if you're here or watching online if it's live or watching whenever it is if you're, if you're watching it later. This talk is, I hope you'll indulge me, but it's a little bit of a, a walk down memory lane for me because this research has uh, basically occupied my entire professional career. And I point that out both because it shows the contingencies of a, of a career, of how things have developed. As you will see as I, as I come along, many of the things that I now have spent a lot of time studying I had no interest in studying initially, never thought I would study them. And it's just, it's moved along in, in contingent and unexpected ways. So, uh, so we, will begin at the begin, we will begin at the beginning of my career shortly, but let's go a little further back because any talk in evolutionary biology, it's almost de rigueur that you start with a photo of Darwin. And of course, he is our patron saint of, of evolutionary biology and he is uh, 
renowned for his, for his scientific acumen. Of course, he's most famous for his uh, theory of evolution by natural selection, but in fact, that was just one of the many ideas about which he has turned out to be remarkably correct. For example, he was able to figure out how coral atolls fo form basically by mountains that they surrounded disappearing into the sea. He deduced the existence of this moth with an, ex an extremely long proboscis from the presence of an orchid with a long tube that that proboscis is, is stuck into, in Madagascar, I might add. And he, uh, he figured out how, how soil was aerated by earthworms. So he was a remarkable observer who, who advanced our science in many different ways, as many of you know. What you may not be aware of, however, is that Darwin was a great experimentalist. And this was before experimental science was the gold standard by which science was conducted. So Darwin, for example, did studies to try to understand how it was that, seed, that plant seeds could survive in salt water to get to islands to establish populations there. He did experiments to test which seeds could survive and which couldn't. He did experiments to understand why, how it is that plants grow towards light uh, he, this is my former colleague at Harvard, uh, Ned Friedman, with some students reenacting one of Darwin's studies, which was to, te to, to understand whether earthworms could hear music or whether they could hear sound at all. So Darwin did many experiments, and he, and he was you know, well ahead of his, of his time in that way as well. However, oddly, he never did any experiments to test his most famous theory. You would think that evolution by natural selection would be something that he might try to test experimentally since it was such a radical idea. Why didn't he do it? Well, the answer is actually very clear. Uh, Darwin, Darwin didn't get everything right. There were a few things that he was wrong about. And I should tell you, some of my colleagues, fellow evolutionary biologists, think it is heresy to say that Darwin got anything wrong, as if he was perfect and, and never made a mistake. But he did get a few things wrong. One of them was genetics. Uh, his work uh, was well before we understood genetics in any way. As you know, Gregor Mendel's work was published a few years after On the Origin of Species, but was overlooked for 35 more years. Darwin's ideas on heredity were just completely wrong. Uh, and who could blame him? There was no science about that then. More importantly for our pur purposes, Darwin was also wrong about the pace of evolution. He thought that evolution occurred extremely slowly. Here's a quote from The Origin. We see nothing of these slow changes in progress until the hand of time has marked the long lapse of ages. He thought that any sort of change to be detectable would take thousands, perhaps millions of years. So of course he never proposed to do an experiment. It was pointless. He couldn't possibly get a result in any meaningful amount of time. And this is the reason that he never did experiments on natural selection. Well. This one, we now know Darwin got completely wrong. We now know that, uh, that when, natural when the environment changes or when natural selection pressures are strong for other reasons, <laughs> evolutionary change can occur extremely rapidly. Uh, this first came to our attention in laboratory studies on uh, selection on organisms like fruit flies that began around the 1920s. And those studies would go something like this. You take a, a population of, oops, there we go, a population of fruit flies with a trait, say the number of bristles on their abdomen. And as in most traits, there's a distribution. And what you do in these experiments is you take the ones with the most bristles and you let them mate with each other and you discard all the rest. And then you take their offspring and do the same thing generation after generation. And what happens is in a remarkably short period of time, you can get a major change. Look at what has occurred here. Not only has the mean value more than doubled, but in fact, the distributions don't even overlap. And this is, in this particular experiment, it was just from 30 or 40 generations of very strong selection. It turns out, you can do this sort of experiment on almost any trait and get a very similar result. So we know in the laboratory, very strong selection will lead to a very marked and rapid evolutionary response. But that, of course, is in the lab. You could, dis dis you could dismiss it as a laboratory artifact. But in fact, this happens in nature as well. And this first became apparent with the famous peppered moth example in England, where uh, scientists in the 1950s realized that moths in England had changed from this very uh, peppery, peppery pattern that blended in very well with, with trees 
to a very dark form that was much more beneficial during the Industrial Revolution when everything was covered with soot. And this change took, uh, uh, took just several decades to go from populations that were entirely, entirely like this to entirely like that. A less known sequel to this story is that in 1966, England passed their Clean Air Act. The skies were clean, the trees became, the soot disappeared, and the moths uh, evolved back to their original coloration. Well, studies like this are now very common. Uh, we know them very well from organisms evolving to thwart our efforts to, uh, to kill them. The evolution of rodenticides, insecticides, herbicides, and so on. All of these are very rapid examples of species evolving in response to strong selective pressures. And of course, antibiotic resistance, which we all know all too well, are microbes evolving to circumvent the selective pressures that we have imposed on them with our drugs. So in the period from the 1950s to the 1970s, it became clear that when humans change the environment in very strong ways, species will rapidly adapt. Still, you could dismiss this, well, that's because humans have, have made major changes that are unlike what occurs naturally. But now we're realizing that even in natural situations, evolution can occur rapidly. And probably the most famous study of this sort, which many of you may know of, is work on the Galapagos Islands by a pair of Princeton University biologists, Peter and Rosemary Grant, showing that the birds named after Darwin, Darwin's finches, evolve very rapidly. In wet years, seeds become very abundant, particularly very small seeds, and birds with little beaks that are very deft at handling those small seeds, they get more food, and the trait evolves, and, then, and they reproduce more, and the population evolves to have smaller beaks. But then occasionally a drought comes along. All the small seeds get eaten up, and all that is left are very large seeds. And only the birds with the biggest beaks, like, such as this one down here, are able to crack the seeds. And so they survive, the others die, and the population evolves in the other way. But it showed that as a result of natural thing, uh, uh, phenomena going on in natural populations, evolution can occur very rapidly. And finally, a study that occurred about the same time as the grants were starting their work in the Galapagos was done by this man, John Endler. And it was done on this fish, uh, which you all probably recognize as the guppy. And I highlight this not only because it was a now classic work, but I heard Endler speak on this work when I was in college, my junior year. I remember very clearly he came to give the department seminar and on this work here that was published in 1981, the work I'm about to, about to uh, tell you about. And that work made a, it was an amazing study, as I'll show you in a moment. I remember leaving the lecture hall and listening to the graduate students who I was walking out with, just raving, who knew evolutionary ecology could be an experimental science? So I, I remembered this work very carefully, uh, very clearly. And that, the reason I point that out will be uh, clear in a moment. So anyway, does anyone here know where guppies actually come from naturally? Amazon, close, is a good guess. You're in the, in the right ballpark. Well, they come from Trinidad and nearby Venezuela. And they live in streams up in the mountains of Trinidad and some in Venezuela. And they actually are quite, there's the streams, they are quite variable from one part of the stream to another. So in some places they are extremely colorful, these are the males, like this one. In other places they're quite drab. In fact, the first person who noted that was a remarkable scientist named Carol Haskins, who in the middle of the last century was a very important p uh, figure in science and was based here in Washington, and I'm guessing was a member of the society. But regardless, he was uh, just one of these polymaths who did all kinds of things. He is the one who, who recognized that guppies were quite variable and studied the genetics of this uh, variation in color. Well, John Endler came along, and he, he learned of Haskins' work, and I can't remember if it was Haskins or Endler who realized that this variation in color corresponded to the presence or absence of this fish here, a larger fish called the pike cichlid that eats guppies. And what um, the hypothesis was that for, for some reason, so in the presence of, of the predator, males could not afford to be colorful. They would be too obvious, the predators would eat them, and so the males were drab. But in the absence of predators, colorfulness was favored because for some reason females go gaga for a flashy male. It turns out that's actually correct. Females do prefer colorful males, we're not sure why, but it's a very strong selective pressure. The most colorful male gets the most mates and uh, 
reproduces the best. And so the idea was that the difference in, in coloration of guppies was a result of predation. But this conclusion was based entirely on a correlation between presence or absence of the predator and colorful males. And as we all know, correlation does not prove causation. And so this is where John Endler came in. He said, I'm going to do an experiment. And, and he did exactly that. What he did was he took a stream, a place in a stream where the two, the predator and the prey coexisted, the guppies were drab, and he moved some of the guppies up to a pool where the predators didn't occur. We can talk later why, they, why the guppies occurred there, not the predators. Well, why, anyway, we'll talk about distribution if you're interested. His prediction, in the absence of predators, the guppies should evolve to become more colorful, the males. And that is exactly what happened over actually a very few generations. He then repeated this experiment in greenhouse, in greenhouse settings with pools of water in, at Princeton University and got the exact same result. In the absence of predators, the guppies evolved to be much more colorful. So a clear demonstration of, of the, uh, that rapid evolution can occur based on environmental conditions. Now, between the work of Endler in very natural settings and the work on the Galapagos, that was the clinching deal. There was no longer could it be disputed that evolution can occur rapidly when, when environmental conditions favor it. And in fact, in the last 30 to 40 years, we have seen example after example demonstrating this, so much so that I would say that it is now the expectation that when the environment changes, species will evolve instead of being a, a rare, unexpected finding. So, this in turn uh, set the stage for the work that, I, that I'm going to talk about today. And it all began with a paper published when I was in college by uh, famous ecologists Tom and Amy Shainer. And that work involved this lizard here, a species called the brown anole. If you've ever been to Florida, you must have seen them running around on sidewalks and they're very common. Uh, this lizard is the workhorse of, of my research and we're gonna see a lot of it. The brown anole, Anolis sagre. Well, what the Shaners did is they, they noticed that on very small islands in the Bahamas, you did not find these lizards. On all other islands you did, but the very smallest islands you didn't. And so Shaner, the Shaners decided to introduce populations of these lizards to the small islands to watch them go extinct. He, they figured they couldn't survive on these islands. They wanted to learn something about how population extinction occurs, a phenomenon we still need to know about. And so they set up this experiment. However, what they found was, in fact, the lizards didn't go extinct. What this shows is the size of the island and whether the, the populations persisted once they put the lizards there for how many years. And you can see that islands greater than essentially 10 square meters, that's three meters by three meters, any island bigger than that, you put the lizards on the island, the population will reproduce and survive indefinitely. And so that suggested that, in fact, on most of these tiny islands where you do not see lizards naturally, the lizards could exist. And so the question then is, is why aren't the lizards on these islands if they can persist there? We'll come back to that question later. But this phenomenon then set the stage for the research that I, I began doing. And the reason is I was doing my PhD work at this, uh, I discovered this paper while I was doing my PhD work a few years later, looking at the evolution of leg length in this group of lizards in the genus Anolis. It turns out there are 400 species of these lizards, and so I was trying to understand patterns of evolution in this group. And one thing that we found, so this is an evolutionary tree called a phylogeny, and these are just examples of some of the species, and what we found is that there are, are long-legged and short-legged species interspersed throughout the tree. And what this suggested is that evolving short and long legs, it went back and forth many times over evolutionary history. It was what we call an evolutionarily labile trait. Um, moreover, however, there is an association. Species that use broad surfaces that are often found on tree trunks, for example, have really long hind legs. Whereas species that use narrow surfaces tend to have very short legs. Moreover, we did mechanical studies to see what difference leg length makes to a lizard. And it turns out that on broad surfaces, uh, long-legged lizards can run much faster. Not really surprising, they can move their legs more, and so they can, they can run more quickly. On narrow surfaces, however, 
long-legged lizards fall off. They, they, it's really, really quite funny to watch them in, in slow motion. They reach around and they just miss and they go toppling off. Whereas the short-legged le lizards are quite capable of moving on narrow surfaces. So it seemed very plausible that species were evolving their legs to adapt to the surfaces they use. But once again, this is just a correlation. And so this is where I, remembering Endler's research and seeing the experiment the Shaners just did, thought, well, maybe there's an opportunity to look that, they, that maybe the, the Shaners had done an experiment inadvertently. And so I will explain that in just a moment, but that was my cold opening. Now here's what we're gonna talk about today in this talk. Experimental field studies of evolution in the Bahamas, a play in four acts. The first act will be just what I was talking about, adaptation to different environments. Then I will study the role of interspecific competition between species in driving evolution. Then we'll talk about the role of predation. Uh, next, we will talk about something called founder effects. And then, if I have time, we'll, we'll have an encore of some recent work. So let's get started. Oh, no, I need to acknowledge this has definitely not been my work entirely. I've had a long list of collaborators, more than collaborators, co, this has been a very joint effort. Uh, most notably, Tom Shainer, a very famous ecologist at the University of California, Davis. He was my postdoctoral mentor and we've worked ever since. Dave Spiller, a research associate with Shainer throughout his career. Two people who were initially graduate students in my lab and are now faculty in their own right, Manuel Leal at the University of Missouri and Jason Colby at the University of Rhode Island. And so this work truly is a collaborative and now we've got a younger generation of, of workers work, working in this system as well. So let's start with first, adaptation to different environments. So this work was conducted in the middle of the Bahamas in the Exuma Keys on an island called Staniel Key. Here is a picture of some of the, so we're going back to those islands that the Shaners placed their, pop, their lizards on. Here's some examples, those two little islands there. They're small islands, or you can see right here on a map. Look at the key, this is one kilometer, so you get a sense of just how small these islands are. They're really small islands. About the size of this room, some of them, give or take, some of them smaller than this room, some a bit larger. So, I read Shaner's the Shaner study, and I guessed, rightly it turns out, that the islands differed in their vegetational characteristics. That some islands would be covered with relatively thick vegetation, small trees, big bushes, and so on. In other words, broad surfaces for lizards to sit on. But other islands would just be covered with this scraggly, narrow vegetation. And so essentially, it occurred to me that the Shaners had inadvertently done an experiment to test the role of vegetational structure on limb length. They had provided islands with different surfaces for them to use and we could predict what would happen. And just a refresher, the prediction is on islands with broad surfaces, the lizards would have long legs. This was the ancestral state because the lizards came from an island with forests. And on the islands with the scrubby vegetation, they would have evolved short legs. And so I talked to Shaner and I was then finishing up my graduate work and I said, you know, Dr. Shainer, has it ever occurred to you that you have inadvertently done an evolution experiment? And Shainer responded in the way that I only could have hoped he would in my wildest dreams, but never really thought was possible. He said, well, that's a great idea. Why don't you come do a postdoc with me and, and find out if that happened or not? Touchdown, a success. And so I went and did that. And here's what, we, here's what happened. So uh, the lizards... The islands did indeed differ in variation, so they were sitting on different surfaces as sort of exemplified by these slides on the different islands. Here I am, what we would do is we would take a motorboat out to these little islands. There's a, a rope right there attached to our motorboat off screen. We would catch the lizards and then I would measure them right there with a little ruler or what I have here is a, um, called a micrometer. I'm looking at its little toes, but the lizards would be measured right then and there takes about five to 10 minutes, and then I'd put the lizard back where we caught him, and he would go about living his life. So that's how we collected our data. And here's the result. Each point here is the mean of a different island, the mean uh, hind limb length and the mean perch diameter, how broad the surfaces were. Now I should tell you, really the axes should have been reversed. It should be, because we're testing the effect of perch diameter on limb length, but it doesn't really matter. Here's the result. It, a, to our surprise, to be honest, there was a significant relationship. Species that used the uh, 
populations, sorry, not species, populations that use narrow surfaces had evolved shorter legs than the populations that use broader surfaces. I should say as well that this was over a period of about 11 to 14 years, which is about 20-ish lizard generations. So they had, they had evolved exactly as predicted, which uh, we thought was pretty cool. So we wrote this up for publication, and it actually was accepted for publication in Nature. And Nature, uh, was something I did not know at this time, every week at that time and to this day, every week when Nature is putting out their next issue, they send out a press release hyping a few of their papers. And they decided to hype our paper, their issue, that issue. And so they, um, here's, the, here's the press release. This may be among the most important work in evolutionary studies since Darwin studied the diversity of finches on the Galapagos Islands during the voyage of the Beagle. It was a nice study, but this is way over the top. Uh, I'm almost embarrassed in a way, but I didn't write it, so not my fault. Anyway, it turns out that we were back in the Bahamas when this came out. And uh, this is back in the mid-1990s. And at the very last minute, when I left for the field, I, on, my, on my voice, my answering machine, back when we had you know, answering machines, I left a, a message saying, I'm in the Bahamas, but if you need to reach me, here is the place we're staying, the manager's office of the place we're staying. I should point out, this was back in the day when hotels and sources, places didn't necessarily have phones in their rooms, and the internet was certainly not in the Bahamas then. So, Here's where we're staying, the lofty fig. And uh, these are the little, the little rooms we were in. So one day we come back and the manager, and this, is, this little pink building is the manager's office, he waves us over and he says, the New York Times is trying to get you. And um, so I, we called the New York Times. Like, the next day, the Boston Globe and USA Today. And, it's, and he was really getting annoyed because then I would get interviewed and tie up his one phone line. Uh, he also thought that this was the craziest thing he'd ever seen. He, he thought we were idiots, these people who paid money to come to the Bahamas to go catch lizards. And suddenly the world's media was beating down his door to talk to us. Uh, but it, it went on like that for a few days. USA Today, uh, so we ended up on, on the front page of the New York Times, or no, front page of Boston Globe, top of the front of the Science Times, New York Times, USA Today um, uh, covered us. ABC News came this close to, send, to sending a film crew to film us in, uh, in, in action. So all of this publicity, which thanks to that ridiculous press release, uh, we got all this publicity, which I must say was good for my career. Uh, and so the paper was published in, in Nature and went around on the talk circuit and people, you know, this was, I should point out, at the just when people were beginning to get the sense that evolution could occur rapidly. It was big news, finding rapid evolution in nature. Uh, now people would just shrug, oh, another example. But back then, this is one of the first studies that really helped convince people. So I'd give this talk, but there would be a problem. I would give a talk, audience like this say, and at the end of the talk, someone would raise their hand, usually a pesky botanist, and they would say, what about phenotypic plasticity? That is, could it be that these are not genetic differences that you are documenting. Could it be that lizards that grow up on narrow surfaces just grow shorter legs? That the populations are not genetically distinct, it's just their environment. This is basically the old nature versus nurture question. Maybe it's just how they grow up. And in fact, it's quite, the reason they, the pesky botanists were bringing this up is it is quite well known among plants. You grow one, a plant in, in the shade and, this, and a clone of the plant in the sun, they will grow differently. Or you give one lots of minerals or lot, lots of nutrients or lots of water and not the other. Conditions matter a lot to the growth of plants. It, the phenomenon is called phenotypic plasticity. And the question was, could that be happening to these lizards? Well, it sounded like an idiotic idea to me, but I kept on getting the question. So finally I said, I'm gonna to have to go to the library, look up the research on the determinants of limb growth in lizards and the effect of uh, perch diameter and so on. Well, you can imagine that was a short search because <laughs> there was no literature whatsoever on that. But there were some relevant studies and this body of research I like to characterize as the craziest set of studies I've ever seen. Although once I said that and someone who did them was in the audience and that was a little embarrassing. But let me give you a, a flavor of the sort of, these, these are researchers who are trying to look at the effect of exercise on limb growth. And so for example, you take a bunch of young mice that are juveniles, that are in their growing phase, and you make some of them run on a wheel for 10 hours a day. 
And then your control group doesn't get a wheel. And so they're a bunch of slugs. They don't get to do that exercise. And so the question is, does running on a wheel make you grow, if you are a mouse, make you grow longer legs? Or they took a bunch of rats and they dumped them in a bathtub or something like that and made them tread water for, I think, four hours. And again, the control group didn't do that. Or they took a bunch of chickens and put them on a treadmill and made them run on the treadmill for a long time and the control, control group didn't. Now I know what some of you are thinking, this Lossus is not much of a zoologist, he doesn't know the difference between a chicken and a mouse. Um, the fact is that if you try Googling chicken treadmill, you're not gonna find any images, so I use this. However, after giving this talk once, someone did send me this, which perhaps I should be using <laughs> instead. Anyway. The point is, there are a lot of studies of this general sort, looking at the effect of exercise during growth, the growth period of an organism on bone, uh, limb bone uh, characteristics. What many of these studies find is that if lizard, uh, sorry, any sort of animal that exercises more will develop thicker bones. And this is actually true of people as well, that weightlifters, their, their arm bones are much thicker than, say, mine. Um, it, it turns out, and I did not know this at the time, that bone is a very dynamic substance. And if you put more strain on a bone, it will lay down more calcium to, to give it more strength to resist the, the strains and stresses you're putting on it. And so it is well documented that in these studies that exercise causes thicker bones. But our studies weren't looking at bone, at limb thickness, they were looking at length. And there was almost no studies that showed this exercise affected the length of the bone with one notable exception. This was a study conducted in 1950 on professional tennis players, male tennis players. And the reason for doing this, of course, is if you think about professional tennis players, ever since they were little boys, this was just men, but presumably the same with women, they've been smacking balls around every day, you know, time and time again, and putting incredible stresses on their serving arm. And you could use the non-serving arm as a control. And it turns out, sure enough, that professional tennis players have longer serving arms than non-serving arms. And this was based on x-rays, on radiographs. It's not that the, the connective tissue was looser and the arm was hanging lower. The bones themselves were longer. And so this did show that it is possible in some situations that how an organism, what an organism does as it grows may affect how long its legs uh, grow to. So, we had to do an experiment. And so what we did is we got baby brown and oles, and we took them to the St. Louis Zoo, and we grew them in two situations. In one situation, they were on very broad surfaces. This is what they do naturally. And this is, this is a happy lizard, all sprawled out, big smile on his face. This is what they normally do. The other treatment, we made them sit growing on these narrow surfaces. He is not a happy camper. And this is narrower than they normally did. And so we, these were young lizards when we got them. We grew them up for several months, and then we measured their leg length. And so the question is, was there a difference in leg length depending on which, which treatment they experienced? And first, here's the difference between males and females. And what we see is that males have longer legs than females. This is corrected for body size, so it's not just they're bigger lizards, but even sub, uh, subtracting out size effects. Now this is well known. This is what's called a sexually dimorphic trait. It's well known that males have longer hind limbs than females, so it was good to uh, conf confirm that, but that was expected. The question though is, was there a difference between long and, sh and uh, or sorry, between wide and narrow perches? And it turns out there was. In both males and females, the individuals that grew on the broad surface had longer legs than the ones on narrow surfaces. We were, frankly, surprised, so surprised we did the experiment a second time and got the same result. So, in fact, there is a component of phenotypic plasticity of the nurture effect on limb length. Now, the question is, did that then explain the findings that we found on the different islands in our study? And we, at this point, only have indirect evidence, and that indirect evidence is this. This is the difference in limb length in our experiment between broad and narrow surfaces. This red bar shows you the mean difference. By contrast, this is a variation just in natural populations, and this is the difference in our, exp in our experimental introductions that had been around for about 15 years. So as you can see, the amount of variation among these islands is much greater than we produced in our experiment. And our experiment had a pretty extreme difference in the, in the environments the lizards were occupying. So we deduce from this that although phenotypic plasticity may have played 
some role in this that most of the difference must be genetically based, that they must truly have evolved genetic differences in leg length. We've been waiting for the day that we could actually find the genes regulating limb length and actually test for genetic differences. It's taken longer than we expected. We're getting close. Hopefully in a few years, we'll be able to actually look at the individuals and look at their, their genomes and find whether there is genetic difference. But I would argue that these data strongly suggest that the differences primarily were evolved genetic differences among populations. Well, with that, I'm going to move to part two of the talk, which is looking at the role of interspecific competition, that is, uh, competition between species in driving differences in habitat use that in turn may cause different species to have different leg lengths. And for that, we're going to move slightly to the south to the island of Great Exuma in the same general area, and we're going to introduce a second character to this story, and that is this species here, the green anole, Anolis smaragdinus. Now, some of you may be familiar with the green anole in the southeastern United States, Anolis carolinensis. They are closely related species. This is basically the Bahamian version of the American green anole. So these two species occur widely throughout the Bahamas together. And so in this case, we did experiments in which we found 15 small islands in around uh, Great Exuma, that didn't, small islands that did not contain any lizards. And we grouped these 15 islands into sets of three similar islands. So we had five sets of three similar islands. Within a set, we randomly chose one island to get green anoles, one island to get brown anoles, and one island to get both species. And so the idea was that if the species have interact with each other negatively, then they should have lower population sizes in the presence of the other species. So we had those three treatments replic replicated across five sets of islands. And so our questions were, first, can, remember, these islands were all empty of lizards. They were below the size threshold. As in the previous study, would brown anoles be able to survive if we put them on the islands? And what about green anoles? Would they be able to survive? And finally, would the two species show evidence of interactions? Let's go with the first question. One year into the study, all, we put five lizards on the islands, two males and three females. One year into the study, all populations had at least doubled in size, and as you can see, some of the populations had exploded. Three years later, nine out of 10 populations are extremely well established. Inexplic inexplicably, one island had only a single lizard on it, but that population bounced back in subsequent years. So bottom line, just as in the first study, you put brown anoles on these small islands where you don't find them naturally, and they go gangbusters. What about the green anoles? Here the story was different. In the first year, most of the islands had, had done well, although not all, but three years in, four islands have gone extinct, and two islands are down to a single individual, in both cases a male. So it seems that green anoles have problems on these small islands that brown anoles don't. Unclear what those are, I'm guessing these islands are just too windswept and thus too, it's too dry for them. They, they dry out, they dehydrate too quickly, but we've never actually followed up to demonstrate that. But the third question, is there evidence that the species interact with each other? Well, remember, we had five sets of islands, and in each set, there was one island where the green anoles were by themselves, and one island where the green anoles were in the presence of the brown anoles. And what we see here, the red line is the population density of green anoles by themselves, and the yellow line is the population of green anoles in the presence of brown anoles. And what we see in all five sets is that in the middle of the experiment, when times are good, the red line is always higher than the yellow line. In all five sets, the population of green anoles by itself does better than the population of green anoles in the presence of brown anoles. In other words, brown anoles have a strong negative effect on green anoles. So that leads us then to an, the next question, which is why don't, why don't brown anoles in particular occur on these islands? We've now shown in two different experiments that if you put the brown anoles there, they do fine, at least for the, the several year course of our experiments. So it must be something that occurs irregularly, a major impact that can explain why they're there, not there. So let me pose the question to you. What occurs in the Caribbean, a big impact every once in a while? 
Hurricanes, of course. And in fact, that's what the Shaners had, had postulated in their initial paper, that maybe it was the hurricanes that explained the absence from the islands, that, that, uh, they come, that lizards can get across water to establish new populations, but it doesn't occur a lot. And so if a hurricane wipes all the lizards off an island, it takes a long time for those islands to be recolonized. So that was Shaner's hypothesis. And, um, but the Shaners uh, the, had a problem. And that is, they started their research in the Bahamas um, right here, just as their, the climate had entered a natural cycle. Naturally, before we started warming the planet, hurricane activity kind of rose and fell over a, you know, de a multi-decadal period. And so just as, as Shaner started his work, we entered a lull in hurricane activity. And so he had this idea that hurricanes were important. And he was going to the Bahamas in a number of different places year after year, but a hurricane never came along until 1995. This is Hurricane Lily churning its way across Cuba. It's a category two hurricane, so not the biggest hurricane, but it's a hurricane. And the important point is it was headed straight to our study islands. So we had mixed feelings about this. On the one hand, we were excited. Maybe finally we could see the effect of hurricanes. But on the other hand, we were on the islands at the time. <laughs> so, however, as soon as the hurricane passed over Cuba, it took a hard turn to the right, and as you can see, was going below our study site. But then it turned right back, and it came straight towards us. And so we would listen to the, the updates every three hours on the BBC radio, the Bahamas Broadcast Corporation, and they would give us the coordinates and, and the local bank gave us a little map so that everyone could follow along and plot the hurricane and it was coming right at us. And sure enough, it scored a direct hit. The eye of the hurricane went directly over the island. And the effects were dramatic. Uh, many trees such as this one were completely uprooted or broken in half. We counted 17 yachts in the harbor that were destroyed uh, and so on. The, it, was, it was a big deal. So we helped clean up the day after the hurricane and then we went Oh, I should say, just by good fortune, we had just completed our, our surveys for the year. So we knew what the islands had been like, you know, a week before the hurricane, in some cases three days before the hurricane. So we had an almost unique perspective before and after. So the second day after the hurricane, we went, we got our little boat out of the tree that it landed in. Amazingly, I did not get a photograph of that. This was pre-iPhone cell phone days, but I wish I did. But our little motorboat was in a tree. We put it back in the water. We went to our study islands. Now, one thing I didn't point out to you before is that our study site is right here in Georgetown on Great Exuma. Our experimental islands are in two sets, one of them here in the southwest of Great Exuma and the other here to the northeast. So the hurricane hit the ones in the southwest, then went over Great Exuma, then hit the ones on the northeast. Hurricanes slow down over land. However, Great Exuma is only one mile wide, which is not enough land mass to substantially slow down the hurricane. So the wind speed should have been the same. So we first went back to, to the islands on the northwest side, on the lee side of Great Exuma. And what we saw when we visited these islands is that there were a lot of branches that were broken, a lot of leaves had been wiped off the, the bushes and so on. Something clearly had happened, but by the same token, it was a, a quantitative effect, an effective degree. It, something had messed it up, but the islands were still pretty similar. And we went to recensus <clears throat> the lizard population. Remember, that was only from a week before, more or less. And here's what we found. The brown and old population was down by 40% from what it had been a week earlier, and the green and olds down by a third. So the hurricanes did have an effect, an effect but as I said, a, a quantitative one. Then we went to the other islands on the southwest, and this was my favorite island. This was an extremely lush island. This is the one island that the green and olds had really taken off. They, they really exploded. And you go walking through this vegetation, which was about knee to hip high, and the green would just be hopping out of your way like little grasshoppers. They were all over the place. It was delightful. Here's the island afterwards. We, didn't, we thought we were in the wrong place. Almost all the vegetation, all the big vegetation, completely gone. And that was true, in fact, of every island. This island here, these had been two uh, trees 10 feet tall with a big 10 feet canopy, just snapped off and all the vegeta other vegetation gone. Same thing here in this third island. So they had clearly been pummeled by the hurricane. So we then went out to, 
to census the lizard populations, turned out to be pretty easy, no lizards on the island. And that showed that in fact hurricanes could eliminate lizard populations from islands of this size. Now the last question of course is why did it occur only on the southwest but not the northeast? As I told you, the wind speed was the same. Well the answer which we probably know from recent hurricanes, well here's a clue. On the top of one of our islands was this. Now, we're terrestrial biologists, not marine biologists, but even we knew that starfish do not live on the top of islands. What this clearly indicated was that the islands were underwater, that the islands were hit by the storm surge, which was about 15 feet, and these islands are only about five feet above sea level, and that had two effects. It hit it with great force, stripping away the vegetation, and then submerged the islands for about six hours. And, but then what happens is the storm surge hits the island of Great Exuma, which maximum ele elevation is 30 to 50 feet, which stops the storm surge, and there wasn't enough open water on the other side before our islands there to develop a new storm surge. And so it showed that it is the storm, the uh, storm surge, hard to say, is the storm surge that causes, that wipes the lizards out, not the wind speed itself. Well. That ended that experiment, and that um, was okay. We had sort of gotten the sense of what goes on in that experiment. We then decided to study a different phenomenon, and that is a question that has been of great interest to ecologists in recent years, which is the role of predation in shaping evolution. And so the specific question we wanted to ask is, what role does predation play in anole habitat use and evolutionary adaptation? So to address that question, we moved again, this time to the north of, of the Bahamas, to the island of Abaco, around the town of Marsh Harbor. And here we introduce another actor to our story, and that's this, this guy here, the curly-tailed lizard. This is a lizard that is larger than brown and oles. It has a total body length of about this long. Uh, it's almost entirely terrestrial, and it eats brown and oles. We knew this from previous observations. What we didn't know, though, is how important an evolutionary phenomenon is this? Is this something that just happens once in a blue moon and has no significant effect overall? Or is it a very major force that really shapes the population? So we decided to, to do an experiment along the lines of the same ones we'd done before, a little bit different in that the islands we were using were larger than the previous islands and the brown anoles occurred naturally on these islands. And in this case, um, so we introduced the curly-tailed lizards. We had 12 islands, and we paired the islands in similar islands, and in each pair flipped the coin and randomly put the curly-tailed lizards on one island and not the, island, uh, not the other. So two treatments replicated six times. Well, I had the great fortune to work with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which many of you may know, to make a film about this work, and they explained it in a much more fun way than I can. So let's see what they had to say. Jonathan wondered if he could also create an experiment that would lead natural selection to favor longer legs. He found islands that already had a knolls that lived primarily on the ground. His team caught and measured each lizard. Then he brought in a predator a species of larger curly-tailed lizards that eat anoles. Here's the bad boy of our experiment. This is the curly-tailed lizard. Now, what we did is we added them to half of our islands. These are very voracious predators. What we wanted to know was what effect would this guy have on the anoles on the island? Would the anoles evolve longer legs to run faster? or larger body size to defend themselves? Yes, excellent question. Well, let's see what happens. So here's the data. Um, first, this is the population size. As you can see, the open circles are where the brown and oil is just by itself. The closed circles are where we introduce the predators. You can see at the start of the experiment, the populations are about the same. What happens, we start the experiment in spring when they're breeding, the Populations without the predators, you can see the population doubles in size, but the uh, ones with the predators barely increase at all. 
clearly what is happening is that the predatory lizards are eating the baby brown anoles, because that's, that's what accounts for this big increase in size, as well as some of the adults. And very quickly, there's a two-fold difference in population size that then holds on throughout the entirety of the experiment. So very clearly, these predators do have a major effect on the populations of these lizards. The predation is having you know, a, a very large effect. Now, in turn, the brown anoles are no dummies, and that in the presence of the curly tail lizards, they start moving up higher into the vegetation. Remember, the curly tail lizards are almost entirely terrestrial, and so they are getting up, getting away from them. Now, why it continues to go up throughout the course of the experiment, I don't know, but very clearly there's a difference of what they're doing in the presence of the predators and in their absence. Unfortunately, we never got to see the evolutionary result. This is Hurricane Floyd. This is our study site. And so the lizard populations were devastated. The curly tail lizards were wiped out. Um, all of the lizards, brown anoles on the islands, also were wiped out. But there was one curious feature. We went back to these islands. We weren't there when the hurricane happened. We went back there about six, uh, six weeks later. The islands were covered with baby lizards. What apparently had happened is that there had been eggs in the soil that had survived being underwater for six hours and had hatched out and had re replenished the population. Now, why didn't this happen in the previous hurricane? Because the previous one had been about a month later and the reproductive season had ended. We actually did some experiments because we would have thought that lizard eggs couldn't survive being under salt water for six, uh, six hours. It turns out that young eggs, which don't need much oxygen, no big deal. And so um, apparently that's what happened. So we were able to thus start the experiment again. We had to wait about four years for the lizard populations to really get established and for the islands themselves, the vegetation to recover. But we started the same experiment again, uh, randomly choosing the islands for the predators and not. But this time we did something different. Um, here's just the islands. Uh, this time we went and we captured all the brown anoles on the islands before we started the experiment and we measured how long their legs were and a few other traits and then we injected each lizard with a rubbery non-toxic substance that you could see through their skin. And so for example, this one has a yellow band, a yellow one here in its upper arm on the left side and a orange one on the femur on the right side. These are like bird bands and each lizard got its own unique marking. And this was important because we could come back six months later, catch the lizards and say, oh, that's Fred and there's Bob and so on. He made it. And on the other hand, where is Louie? He must have died because we weren't able to find him. And so we could see which lizards survived and which ones didn't. And then we could see whether their leg length affected that was correlated with their survival, which is natural selection. We were testing whether a feature of anatomy was correlated with their survival. And so that's what we did. Well, let's find out what happened. Back to HHMI. After six months, he returned and discovered that on average, the survivors did have longer legs. They were better able to elude their foe. But after 12 months, Jonathan's team returned again and discovered that now, most of the lizards were living high in the bushes to escape the predators. And on average, the survivors had shorter legs. Generation after generation, they're going to be up in the bushes. The shorter-legged lizards will do better, and we expect the population to evolve shorter legs. Jonathan had seen how predation can create strong selective pressures for longer legs on the ground and shorter legs in the bushes. Well, I have to make one editorial comment. I objected strenuously to my colleagues being referred to as my team because this was a joint effort um, and they refused to change that. And they said it makes a bad story arc. But I do want to make clear that this was a collaborative work with the other people involved in this study. Um, they were not my team. Having said that, here's quickly the results that were just summarized. Um, once again in this study, in the presence of curly tails, I, this is a different graph, but this is the percentage on the ground. In the presence of the predators, they get off the ground a lot more than in the absence of predators. So they were moving up into the vegetation. We, we measured something called a selection gradient, which is basically the difference between the survivors and the non-survivors. If the survivors had longer legs, there would be a large positive selection gradient. If the survivors had shorter legs than the uh, non-survivors, 
then it would be a negative gradient. And if the limb lengths of survivors and non-survivors was the same, it would have a value of zero. So here's what we found. For the islands with the predators, selection was strong and positive. The curly-tailed lizards were favoring longer-legged lizards by, by catching the shorter-legged ones, whereas on the control, there was no difference whatsoever. The, for the, and this is in the first six-month period. The curly-tails were take, were natural selection was operating in the presence of curly-tails, but not in their absence. Surprising, but one other thing we knew is when they go high up into the bushes, this is the, sign I, the slide I showed you before, they also use narrower vegetation. The, the stems are thinner towards the top of the bushes. So the higher they get, the shorter, uh, the narrower the surface. Now, we know what happens over millions of years when these lizards use narrow surfaces. They evolve shorter legs. So our prediction was that eventually, once the brown and are up in the bushes, the short-legged ones will do better and selection should, be favor, should favor shorter legs, not longer legs. To our surprise, that switch in selection happened in the second six-month period. Now in the presence of curly tails, shorter leg lizards are surviving better. But again, in the absence of curly tails, no selection at all. So we had shown a complex selection environment where curly tail lizards initially favor long-legged lizards, but then favor short-legged lizards. Over time, However, it's not going to cycle back and forth because the lizards, the brown anoles, are stuck up in the bushes. Once they get up there, generation after generation, we expect to see selection favoring shorter legs. And we were very excited to find out would actually sh the lizards evolve to become like the, the twig species I showed you. Well, I know, so what happened next? I know what you're thinking. Another hurricane. Wrong. Two hurricanes. This is uh, Hurricane Francis, early September 2004, scored a direct hit on our islands. Three weeks later, Hurricane Jean went out of its way to hit our island, did a loop-de-loop -loop to come back and go over them, thus ending that experiment. Um, I should tell you that in the subsequent now almost 20 years since this time, we have repeatedly tried to continue this uh, experiment, but we've now entered a high phase of hurricane activity, perhaps due to human global warming, perhaps not, that's unclear, but the much greater hurricane activity is, un, is certainly happening, and our experiments keep on getting disrupted, which is a bummer, because we would like this experiment to go long enough to find out what happened. But having said that, I'm now going to quickly go to the last major act of this talk, which is the founder effect theory. And I will cruise through this quickly, but the famous evolutionary biologist, Ernst Meyer, probably the most famous evolutionary biologist of the first half of the last century, a titan in the field, proposed what he called the founder effect theory. And the idea is that if you create a population from very few individuals, just by random chance, those individuals will have a different genetic makeup than the whole population average. I mean, imagine that three individuals from this room started a population. Just by chance, there might be three people with blonde hair or whatever trait. And you, just that what's called the founder effect could lead to random changes. Meyer suggested that such random changes might play a very important ro uh, role in sending evolution in a new direction. Well, these lizards presumably found that they are able to colonize across water. As I told you, it could well be that an island is colonized by a single female. Perhaps she's already been inseminated so the results of a single female and perhaps a single male. So founder effects, in theory, could be important in this system. I always wanted to just to see if that was possible. Well, after the last hurricane that I told you about had cleared off a number of islands that we knew could support lizards, I said, let's give it a shot. Let's take a bunch of islands and put a single male and a single female and see what happens. Now. Scientists, we are taught, you do not do things just to see what happens. You're supposed to have a very clear hypothesis that you're going to test and so on. And I could formulate this as a hypothesis, but really I just wanted to see what happened. Um, so what we did is we, we found seven small islands that we knew could support lizards but didn't have any. And we took individuals from this forested island in the background. This is a good time for me to point out what we're doing, introducing lizards, sounds bad. Invasive species are a problem all over the world. These are lizards that occur 
you know, we're, we're talking 100 meters. We're, we're introducing them in places they occur naturally all the time. And as we've shown, we've seen lizards colonize these islands naturally. We've seen them go extinct. So we're just mimicking a natural process. We're not bringing in something that doesn't belong there. Anyway, we took the lizards, but from this area where they occur in a forest, they have longer legs, we put them on these small islands. And so the question is, what will happen? Will our prediction, if they're adapting, is that they should evolve shorter legs, but will there be crazy things that happen just to ran due to random sampling? So here's just some of the islands to show them to you, very small and scrubby. And so the populations, a male and a female on each island, you can see very quickly the populations grew quite large. So you might have thought inbreeding would be a problem, but this population got up to 40 individuals, even the worst population got up to 10. Um, so they did, they did just fine. Um, one thing we looked at was the genetic variation and, um, you know, I'm not gonna tell you about this. I, I, it's interesting. We found that you put two lizards on an island, they were genetically, some of the islands were quite distinct just because two lizards happened to have their own particular genetic uh, constitution, just by chance. Now, the fun part of this is our approach had matured since early in the study. Remember, I was on that island measuring the lizards right there? Well, now we had an x-ray machine, and I love this x-ray machine. And so we'd take the lizards, and we'd take it, them, we'd catch them, bring them back to our field laboratory, the condo we were renting, and we have this, this portable x-ray machine. This is the source of the x-rays. If you look carefully, this little plate has a lizard on it. This is like the plate you put in your mouth when you go to the dentist these days. Um, so we lightly anesthetize the lizard and we take an x-ray of it. And this is great for a couple of reasons. One is it's more accurate than measuring them by hand. Even more importantly, we have the image later on such that if a result of a measurement doesn't look quite right, we can go remeasure it on the x-ray. Whereas in the field, you write down what you measured it, you let the lizard go, there's no way to see if you made a mistake. So I love this x-ray machine. Plus we found all kinds of cool stuff. If you look carefully, can anyone figure out what's in the body of this smallish brown and all, those black things? Not seeds, not skulls, not in this one. Jerry, is Jerry in here? There's, there's, I don't know, I don't think they're Syrian, but they're snails. We did not know that these lizards ate these tiny little snails, but we found them in quite a few lizards. Now this is a, a female, and this is a little harder to see, but that is an egg. These females contain enormous eggs that they lay, and that's why they only lay one egg at a time, because they're quite large. Finally, here, there's a snail up there. What's this here? Heard the answer earlier. It's a skull. We found a number of cases of, of cannibalism, of usually big males eating little babies. Yeah, it's sad, I know. Uh, this was a very interesting, this is a different study, but there was one island that had a bunch of amputees. And, you know, it was only a couple percent of the population, but normally that's quite rare, and we really don't know the explanation for that. Um, my guess is it's either sea, some particular seabird was there or maybe a lot of crabs, but it was just notable how many there were. Anyway, lots of fun with x-rays. We also measured their toe pads with a scanner. This is Jason Colby. I'll, uh, toe pads will come to us in a minute. Uh, we also measured the color of their dewlap. This lizard is perfectly fine, but we have a, uh, a spectrophotometer getting precise measurements of color because one of the things we wanted to look at was would the color of their dewlap, is that structure called, be changed due to just random sampling of the two of the lizards we put in there? Turns out it didn't. Uh, too bad, it would have been interesting if they did. So this is the measurements of the first generation of limb length, and you can see this is a founder effect. Just by the individuals we put in, some populations have very long legs, some have short legs. Zero is the mean of the whole population that they came from. So we did create a founder effect of of individuals different just due to the sampling of the founders of the population. So the question is, would they evolve shorter legs as predicted, and would there be evidence of the founder effect having any long-lasting effect? Well, here's what we found. All seven populations evolved shorter legs. That clear evidence that they were adapting to narrow surfaces. And that is indicated by the year effect in our statistics showing that over years they got shorter. But there's also a island effect. And what that means is you can see this is the differences at the start of the experiment. This is our founder effect. 
And at the end of the experiment, those differences are mostly the same. The ones that started with short legs, they've evolved sh shorter, but they still have the shortest legs. In other words, the, the founder effect caused by random sampling persists even as, as the species uh, adapt to their circumstances. Well, there are people who argue in evolutionary biology that founder effects will have no major effect, that natural selection will just wipe them away. Uh, so our results were interesting because the, the idea has rarely been tested. Now they could say, well, it's only over four years. If you'd gone for another 20 years, natural selection would have erased it, and that might be true. But it was a nice demonstration that founder effects experimentally tested might have such an effect. And just again to compare to the plasticity study early on, here are the differences in the seven islands compared to what we, what we could do uh, with our plasticity experiment. So again, suggesting that these are genetic changes. And I'd be happy to talk about testing for genetic differences uh, in the Q&A if you'd like. All right, so what happens? Who hurricanes? You remember Hurricane Irene maybe? The next year, Sandy. Sadly, all seven populations were wiped out. Um, bummer, because that was an interesting experiment. All right, I am going to quickly go through my encore, uh, some more recent work that in both cases done by postdoctoral fellows in the lab. Uh, I've been very fortunate through the years to be blessed with brilliant postdocs um, who are also, it turns out, very stubborn. Because in both of these experiments, my role was to tell them that is a bad idea. It is very unlikely to get a good result. You're wasting your time. And they refused to listen to me and they did their experiments and they turned out to be right and I was wrong. So um, I want to be completely honest, my role has been to be a naysayer. The first uh, was done by this guy here, Oriol La Piedra, and he was interested in whether natural selection could actually work on behavior in these lizards. And so he used the same system that we'd worked with before, with the brown anoles and the curly-tailed anoles, and his question is, would predation uh, operate on behavioral differences as well as anatomical ones? So here was his theory. Imagine, so these lizards sit on trees or bushes or whatever. You can imagine that lizards might differ in their behavioral tendencies. In the last decade or two, there's been a lot of research on what has been called animal personalities. Basically the idea that animals have different tendencies just like we do. And so sometimes it, there's a lot of anthropomorphizing going on that is criticized, but you could imagine, I'm gonna do it anyway, but. I'm doing it in quotes. Whenever I say this, picture my air quotes. Uh, you can imagine there are bold lizards and cautious lizards. And so you can imagine that the, uh, the bold lizards are happy to run down to the ground and capture prey and, and cavort with each other. And the cautious ones, they stay on the bush, on the tree, and they're very unlikely to go to the ground. And so you could imagine if we could show this, what we call propensity to forage as a distribution among individuals, you could imagine that individuals vary in that, in that likelihood. You can also imagine that in the present, in the absence of predators, the bold ones that run down to the ground all the time are gonna do better, because that's where all the food is, and that's where the mating opportunities are. And so you go down there, you eat more, you mate more, things are good. Favorite advantage, bold ones. On the other hand, in the presence of the predators, it might be the other way around. The bold ones run down there, they get caught and eaten, and it's the timid ones that do better. So that was Uriel's idea, that there would be differences in behavior and that natural selection by predators could operate on that behavior. So here's how he tested that. First, he caught 274 lizards, and he designed a behavioral assay to measure differences. And, and um, I'm gonna, here's the assay. You take a lizard, and you put it in a little arena, and you start with the lizard in a box. And then you open the box, the door of the box, and he looks out, and there's a curly tail lizard right in front of him. Now the curly tail lizard is in a cage, and so it can't get to him, a clear plastic container, but they don't know that, they're not that smart. Uh, all it sees is curly tail lizard. Then we take the curly tail lizard along, away, and we ask how long does it take for the lizard to run out into the open, and then how long does it sit there before running up to the safety of the little bush? Very simple assay. Well, it turns out that lizards vary in how long they do that, and in a repeatable way. If you test the same lizard multiple times, you can find consistent differences among individuals. So they do differ in their behavior in ways that potentially could be operated upon by predation. So then the experiment was, was simple. He had these 274 lizards, he knew their behaviors, he just put them on eight islands in the same way we've done before, as shown here, eight islands, and then after a month, four of those islands randomly chose and got predators, and four didn't. 
And so the question was, would selection operate on behavior, and would it differ between islands with and without predators? So we got some of the same results as before. In the presence of predators, they don't survive as well. And in the presence of predators, they move up into the bushes, so the same sort of phenomenon. And then the question is, would there be a difference in survival based on how long they spent out in the open? They're, that is his, his assay of being bold or cautious or whatever you want to call it. Well, this graph shows each lizard's how much time they spent exposed in the open in the lab study and their likelihood of survival. And as you can see, the line is flat. It didn't matter. So there was no selection on behavior on the control islands without the predators. But on the islands with the predators, a very different story. Lizards that stayed out in the open longer were much more likely to get eaten than the one, or to not survive, presumably getting eaten. Very strong selection, in other words, on behavior of these lizards. Now, um, Oriel also is in the process of testing, is this a heritable trait? Is it genetically based? His preliminary data suggests that it is, but I'm, I'm not actually sure where that is right now. Of course, the question is, you would expect then, given enough time, these populations would evolve, if there are genetically based differences, would evolve to be behaviorally quite different. You know what happened? Major hurricane. Hurricane Dorian, which was a really bad one a couple years ago, ravaged the island of Abaco very sadly. And uh, amazing, the population, the curly tails were wiped out, the anoles did survive, and uh, Oriel plans to reestablish the experiment before long. All right. Finally, a study which shows hurricanes in a good light in some way. The last thing I'm going to tell you about, again, a postdoc, this case, Colin Donahue, now at Brown University, uh, working with our collaborator, Anthony Harrell, from the Natural History Museum in Paris. And they worked in a different island, not in the Bahamas, but the next islands to the southeast, the Turks and Caicos. And in particular, two small islands in the Turks and Caicos next, next to each other, Water Key and Pine Key. And the interesting thing about these islands is that they're like many islands in the Caribbean. They've got introduced rats and goats and cats that have ravaged the environment in many ways. And there's a wonderful organization. Oh, I should tell you their focal lizard species is not the brown anole, but a species that has evolved to be extremely similar called Anola scriptus. You would not tell the difference. Uh, I can tell the difference, but they're, they're, they're an example of convergent evolution. They live in the same place. They look alike. Uh, so there's this great organization called Fauna and Flora International that is in the business of removing introduced species from islands to let the ecosystem recover. So Colin had this great idea, let's see how the lizards adapt as the introduced predators are removed and the vegetation recovers, which I thought was a really clever idea. And so he went down there, he and Anthony and a couple others, and they collected the baseline data before uh, the predator before the introduced species were removed. And this is just all that we measured their anatomy, where we found them in the habitat, and so on and so forth. And they left on September 4th, 2017. Now, why am I telling you dates? You know why. Four days later, a hurricane went directly over these islands, Hurricane Irma. And two weeks later, Hurricane Maria did as well and ravaged the islands. Um, and that led Colin to ask the question, what effect did the hurricanes have? Was it just random who survived and who didn't? Or perhaps hurricanes themselves could be a selective pressure by favoring individuals with certain traits that were able to withstand the hurricanes. So as soon as he could, he packed his bags and went back there, I think four weeks after the, uh, yeah, there, three weeks after the second hurricane to look at the populations afterwards, so to do a before and afterwards comparison. Now, one thing I need to point out is this was not a planned experiment. The lizards were not marked. So he could not look at survivors. You know, he could not tell that the animals he was, he didn't have them marked. All he could do is look at the population means and to see if there was a change that occurred before and after. And amazingly, what he found was, what is measured here is the size of their toe pads. And on both islands, afterwards, their toe pads were larger on both the foreleg and the hind leg. There's a number of explanations one could put forward to why you have larger toe pads after a hurricane. The most plausible one, however, is that the ones that we do know that toe pads give them their clinging ability. Bigger toe pads, more clinging ability. His hypothesis is that uh, the ones with the bigger toe pads could hang on, the ones with the small toe pads were blown away. And so in that way, the population, the hurricanes were an agent of natural selection favoring larger toe pads. 
I think that's the most plausible explanation for this result. So this was interesting because for 20 years ago, uh, our group published a paper showing that uh, the towpads of lizards on Caribbean islands are larger than the towpads of lizards in Central and South America. And I have given that result, and people would always ask me, is that because of hurricanes? Because there are very rarely do hurricanes hit, you know, the Amazon, uh, for example. And so maybe the larger towpads in the Caribbean are because of hurricanes. I said, no, no way. Uh, because hurricanes only come along once in a while, and if smaller towpads are favored, even if larger ones were selected in the hurricane, well, they would evolve right back to smaller size after the hurricane, you know, years afterwards. So I really thought it was an implausible explanation. But Colin wanted to test this, given his finding that hurricanes might exert selection. I told him, you're wasting your time. You're, you're just not going to get a result. He got a result. He uh, teamed up with a meteorologist at Penn State, and they calculated over the last 70 years the hurricane frequency on each of a number of islands in the Caribbean. And in particular, they measured the brown anoles leg length from museum specimen, I'm sorry, not leg length, towpad size, on 12 different islands. And the size and color of the dots is proportional to how frequently those islands were hit by hurricanes. And so the prediction is they should have larger towpads on islands hit by hurricanes more frequently. And that's exactly what he found. The greater the hurricane, what do you call it, activity, the larger the towpads. Now, we looked at all kinds of other variables that might be confounding that, island area, uh, rainfall, or anything. There were nothing else correlates with towpad size among these 12 populations uh, except hurricane activity. Okay, well, now I'm beginning to get convinced. And then he did the same thing throughout the Caribbean, looking at species, and got the same result. So at this point, I think he may be right. It's all kind of circumstantial evidence, but it all weighs in the same direction that hurricanes actually could be a selective force with long-lasting impact on the size of their towpads. Well, to wrap up, I'm sick of hurricanes. My sentiments exactly. Uh, I would like to see some of these original experiments actually go to completion. I would like to get some peace and quiet for the people in the Bahamas who are so uh, affected by these hurricanes. Uh, and see how evolution proceeds in their absence. So that's what I'm hoping the future holds. And now, in a shameless bit of self-promotion, I want to point out that um, the book I published five years ago does talk about this Bahamas research, and I kind of think it's an interesting story about how we do these studies. But actually, I'm only showing you this to give you a segue to my book that comes out next month, which is completely different from everything I've talked about, but is about Sci scientific research on the ecology and evolution of domestic cats. And basically the story is, it's a great example of how we study biodiversity just on the domestic cat. We know a lot about where they came from, what they do in the environment, and how they are evolving today, and how they might evolve in the future. And my publisher would really have killed me if I didn't mention that to this audience. So, thank you very much. I'm delighted to have been here today to be a member now of the PSW, and I would be happy to answer some questions. All right, so we're going to uh, have question and answer period, and um, the way we do this is you raise your hand, keep it up long enough. I will start with the red microphone. My name is Scott Matthews, and I am a member. Um, first, I just want to say your presentation is not only scientifically astounding, but it's really entertaining as well. Um, so thank, thank you, you very much thank for you. that. My, I have two questions that I think are related, uh, both from Act One. Um, you, you had a graph of limb length, um, or, or maybe some, some quantitative data on limb length, and it looked like the limbs were spanning from about 2 millimeters long to 2.2 millimeters long. And I'm just wondering about, that, that doesn't seem like a big change, um, even if we sort of normalize. And so I'm wondering just how big that variation is. And I'm wondering if that's related to, you know, you talked about the bigger bones in the weightlifters and the tennis players. And uh, what I'm wondering is, do those changes in the bones occur even later in life? Or is this only if you start lifting weights or playing tennis at a young age? Those are great questions. And thank you for the kind words as well. Let me start with the second question. Um, we don't know whether, uh, those sorts of changes occur late in life. Say you started playing tennis, or I did all of a sudden. I'm going to guess that the le your arms wouldn't get longer because the growth has kind of stopped. 
I can't tell you that for sure. We have, we have no data, but I would say there are some effects of plasticity and certain traits that it can occur any time and can be reversed. I'm guessing that once the growth of mammals or most vertebrates stops, it would not have that impact. But we don't know. No one has done those experiments that I'm aware of, certainly not with the tennis players. Although it's a huge literature and I, I'm no expert, but I, I don't think we know the answer. Um, your first question about the small amount of variation. First, I didn't explain that those measurements are of residuals, which is when you calculate the relationship between body size and limb length. So that's, that's how we remove the effect of size. But still, it's a pretty small difference. And in fact, uh, let me tell you a little story. This work was done in the early 1990s, pre-laptop computer days, and so as I was collecting the data, I had a graph paper and I was graphing it. And I didn't think, there, I wasn't finding any result. And so when I went back to the university afterwards, I was in no hurry to analyze the data because, you know, it wasn't going to show anything. And a couple, it took a couple months. I finished off a bunch of other projects. Finally, like, I got nothing else to do. I'll analyze that data. And that result popped out. And so the point is that the differences, the point is, number one, don't try graphing your data by hand. It's not a good idea. But they were quite small effects that really only the statistical analysis showed. That if you held them in your hand, I would like to think that I could say, oh, yeah, but they're not radical uh, changes. On the other hand, it was only 10 or 15 years. Uh, but you're right, it was relatively small changes. Welcome. I have a, I'm going to sneak in a fundamental question here, which is how many generations are you talking about in these uh, evolutionary studies? Well, so these lizards, it's a complicated question because females can reproduce at three months of age, which means that a female born at the start of the breeding season can reproduce by the end. So you can get two generations of females in a year. Males mature more slowly, and also they don't get the opportunity to mate because the bigger males exclude them. And so it's, it's a complicated question. But let's say two is, let's say one and a half, one and a half to two generations a year. And our experiment, I've wobbled on how long the experiment lasted because actually the introductions were done in two phases. So some of the islands, it was for 11 years and the others were 14 years. So 16 to 20 generations for that first experiment. So it's, so it's not a lot of change, but it's also not a lot of time. It's, yeah, but it's more than two. Right. Yes, correct. Uh, Timothy Thomas, I am a member. I might ask the question now. I'm okay to go? I was going to ask the same question you did. You, <laughs> you said that, uh, you know, there was a breeding season. You showed that they're laying one egg. So that sort of implies you're getting really a lot of evolution in just two or three generations. That's sort of the speed that we could see in human evolution, two or three generations. Do you think like that? Well, one of the things that we now realize is that evolution can occur a lot faster than most people expected. Uh, but in this case, it was 15 to 20 generations. And uh, because it was 11 to 15 years, one thing, I told you that they lay one egg at a time, but they lay an egg every week. So over the course of uh, you know, six to eight months, they can produce a lot of eggs. Uh, most lizards produce you know, 10 to 50 eggs at one time. Uh, these lizards have the same output, but they do it just one by one. Sort of like a chicken. They just keep doing yes, it. Yes, exactly. Ex that's, that's exactly correct. Yes, so uh, some online questions. Um, First from uh, Shravan Rao in Melbourne, Australia. Do we now have a better understanding of the range characteristic, characteristics that are predominantly phenotypic plasticity and characteristics that are clearly genetic variants? Let me make sure I got that, correction, that question correctly. Do we have an idea of the characters that are phenotypically plastic versus those that are genetically based? Yes. I don't think that there's been a lot of research on phenotypic plasticity in the last 20 years. It's become a very popular, uh, an important topic of research. But I'm not sure you can just easily categorize traits as, oh, that's, uh, that's a plastic trait and that's one that's affected by genes. Because for one thing, plasticity itself is a genetic phenomenon, that the ability for an organism to have a plastic res result is a result of its genes. And so, they're not discreetly different in that, in that way. So leg length, we've shown that 
they can be plastic, but we also have very good reason to think there is a genetic basis for it. And so I think most traits, there can be a spectrum. And so I don't think there are two discrete categories. Uh, but the very exciting part is that we're now at the point where we can actually, you know, the, the experiments we did were very coarse. You know, we raise individuals in different environments. We see a difference. So we see plasticity, but we don't know anything about the mechanism. But now with modern genomic technology, people can find exactly how this works. What is it about a lizard on a narrow surface? How does that then activate particular genes to act in certain ways? And we're, we're getting to the point that we can actually mechanistically understand how plasticity works. Um, and so it's an exciting time in that way. But I don't think there are discrete types as your questioner asks. And a question from Anita in DC. How does the study of rapid evolution distinguish between naturally occurring genetic adaptation versus possible mutation due to chemicals that are introduced into the environment through human pollution? Well, uh, there are a number of ways to address that. I mean, most, most mutations caused by chemicals and so on are are not the sort that uh, that get transmitted. They certainly aren't things that lead to adaptive benefits. And uh, as we are able to look at, to find the actual genes and what's going on, um, we're able to actually figure out how this is working. But most effects of chemical spills and so on are Mal malformations and other harms to the pop to individuals that are, are that cause them to to have lower fitness. Uh, certainly, in these sort of experiments we're doing, there would be no reason to think that uh, you know that's why you do an experiment. You expose some individuals to a, a condition and other individ individuals not. But um, so I mean, I think there are different sorts of research is what it comes down to, and people are studying them. And as, as with the previous question, we now have the basis to really get at the mechanisms to figure out what's going on. Okay, and on a different vein from uh, Will Angel, he's a member of the PSW, who's uh, online in DC. What is your favorite species of lizard? Oh, now that's a tough question. You know, it changes from day to day. My favorite species, so the reason I study these lizards is there are 400 species of them. And so they are remarkably successful evolutionarily. And they're a great model to understand how evolutionary diversification occurs. My favorite anole is one from the cloud forests of Ecuador that has a little horn on its nose. And uh, is a great lizard. And I'm, it's also, I'm very fond of it because uh, it, when we went to study it, no one had any idea what it's, how it lived its life. And so we went out and found them and, and figured out some of the things about its natural history. So that's my favorite anole. But then there are chameleons, which are very cool, and uh, the Komodo dragon and related monitor lizards. It's like asking someone to pick their favorite child. I, I, I can't really pick, pick amongst <laughs> them. Okay, the red microphone has a question, and then we have a hand raised up here and uh, right, right next to you there. Now, I was uh, thinking of the uh, chicken and the egg thing when you talked about the tennis player. And I'm wondering if you're saying that tennis players grow longer arms because they're serving tennis balls, or do they choose the longest arm when they decide to take up tennis and start serving? Well, it's funny you ask that, because every other time I've given this talk, I've addressed that question. I thought it was funny. No one ever laughed. So I left it out. Um, you know, there is another explanation. Uh, so you, you posed it in a way that I hadn't thought of, which is if people have different length arms, maybe they choose the longer one to use as their serving on. Possible. Uh, another possibility is that just asymmetric armed, you know, most of us have arms the same length. Maybe you have to have different length arms to become a, a professional tennis player. Can't rule those out. That's the problem with correlations. Uh, they both seem unlikely, but, you know, maybe it is true that uh, only people whose arms are extra long can become professional tennis players. But I think it's much more likely that it's the smacking balls all their life that makes their arms grow longer. Arms? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it's not a topic that has received a lot of research attention beyond the study I mentioned, but I might be wrong. That study was published in the 50s, so quite a while for other people to have looked at the question. Blue microphone, Bob. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a member. Uh, 
Can you speculate of how far this would go if you continue through generations and more generations? The, le the limb length experiment? Uh, hey. Any of the ones you want to comment on? Well, so, yes, that what, so we've got these lizards that are forced up into the bushes using narrow surfaces. We know that lizards with very short legs have evolved to use twigs over millions of years. So we would like to see, that's why I keep trying to do this experiment despite the hurricanes. If this up in the bushes continues for 10, 20, 50 years, will they converge on the very short leg uh, anatomy of the naturally occurring species? That's what we would really like to find out. Um, if I, can we go back to the beginning of the, of the slides? Yeah, I'm not sure, are we at the end or the beginning here? We're at the end. Oh, well, all right. At the early, I sh early on, I showed you the short-legged, what we call twigginals. Their legs are really short, much shorter than what we got in a, in a few generations here. So that's really what we'd like to see, you know, how fast can we drive them? Can we drive them to the, what we know occurs naturally, and how long does that take? I mean, getting back to the question about how much change we observe, which is not very much, but can we get, I'm going the wrong way because the legs are getting shorter, can we get the really short-legged ones? That's, that's what I'd really like to know. We have the red microphone. Oh, yes, uh, Mike Hilton, I am a member. Um, I was wondering if you had, had ever considered to contact NASA and suggest to them some kind of experiment with a, uh, one of these beasts on the International Space Station to measure what kind of effects a, a microgravity or, or gravityless environment would have on their uh, evolution over a number of generations. Uh, your case could be very strong because you have such a wide experience, I mean a deep experience and uh, very, uh, very good uh, background and, and a lot of data on, on the evolution of, of these uh, things anyway. Well, I agree with you, that would be very interesting. Uh, I have to be honest and say it hadn't occurred to me to talk to NASA about that. Uh, there are people, my, some of my colleagues have sent tadpoles into space on, on I can't remember what, what launch, and uh, I think there were some geckos in space too more recently. Uh, they were looking- Mice the, also. Pardon? Mice. And mice, of course, but you know, those are mammals. We're talking about the important oh. herpetological ones. Uh, the tadpoles one was to see how, you know, tadpoles develop into frogs to see what, how that would be disrupted, if it would be disrupted, and I think it was by being in, uh, you know, low gravity or low gravity. I don't know the space, say, I mean, the problem is you'd have to take care of the lizards, and I don't know if it would be interesting to see if they could survive, but it's an interesting idea, and it never occurred to me to ask. Can you, can you, oh, go, go ahead, Mike. Uh, well, I'm sure they would let, want you to jump on the spacecraft and, and go up there and, and uh, maintain the, uh, the, the population. Well, that's what students are for. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you skipped over the microsatellite slide. Yes, uh, that's true about satellites. Um, would you like me to explain it? I, uh, yes, as a molecular biologist, at least I guess, uh, okay, it's, uh, well, can we get back there to that? It may take a little bit of work. So, uh, microsatellites are a type of genetic variation, and, and when we did this study, uh, it's gonna be a while still. Uh, so we wanted to look at the genetics of different individuals in the population, and, oh, oh, went too, no, 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 it's almost there. Yes, here we go, uh, one more. So, yeah, uh, no, go back, all right, so what we, imagine if you will, that two, these two axes are a way of quantifying the genetics of different individuals. They're different genetic constitution. And just go with it that that's uh, statistically appropriate. And let me show you on the screen. Um, so this is the, this square is the mean of the population from which we drew uh, the individuals. This is the experiment where we put two individuals in each island. So this is the mean value here. And each of these dots is a different individual that that we pulled off the, off the source population. All these dots together come to this mean. So the mean is the population as a whole. Well, the colors are the different individuals that went on the different islands. So for example, the two red ones are here and the two green ones are here or so on. And so these are the 
two individuals. And you can see, remember, this is the mean, and these are the two individuals on one island, very different from the mean. And these are the two individuals on this island, again, very different. So this is a founder effect. Just by taking two individuals of the population, randomly, they're genetically quite distinct from the population they come from. So that's when we started the experiment. A year later, you can see that difference has persisted. And so this founder effect in genetics lasted the entire experiment. The axes got switched here, which is stupid of us, but you can see these ones are way off and they've stayed there through the course of the experiment. So the point is, we did create genetically distinct populations simply by choosing two individuals to found each population. And so that's, that's, uh, that's what we did with the microsatellites. Now these days, when it's so much easier to, to sequence entire genomes, we could get a much more sophisticated look at the genetic differences that we had created by this process. And we still have the samples in the freezer, so maybe we will one of these days. Um, but th that's the point, that these founder effects were created. In fact, it turns out that uh, if you were a population biologist and you measured natural populations and you found a population this, this different from the mean, by standard methods, you would say these populations have been evolving separately for tens of thousands of years, and that's how that genetic difference has arisen just through slow change. But we should, this is a clear demonstration that founder effects can really lead to major differences. But I'm right in assuming microsatellites are individual. Yes. So these are really markers of the individual yes, ex animals that you measure. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, a question um, also from Chevron Rao in Melbourne, Australia. Is DNA sequencing helping with this research today? And are there any other uh, technologies in the field or lab that are being used today that you wish you had when you started your research? So the, the DNA is just revolutionizing our ability to look at genetic change, which of course is the core of evolution. Uh, the other change that, in a very different sort, that would be very useful is the ability to put transmitters on animals to see where they move. And uh, the problem is that these lizards are quite small. And so you need a transmitter that's not going to be so heavy that it's going to impair the lizard. And the ability to get these things has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. And so it is now feasible that you could attach a small transmitter to a lizard and follow where it goes and get a real, a really precise idea of how they live their lives. And that's something that is always useful for studying all aspects of organismal biology is a detailed understanding of just what they do and where they do it and so on. And so that is increasingly um, possible these days. So that's something that uh, I wish we'd had years ago and been able to use. So that's, and there's all kinds of changes and all kinds of things, but, but that's the one that immediately comes to mind. There's a vaguely related question. Actually, it's not related. Carrie, Carrie Liss wants to know how you catch these guys, because he said when he was a kid, he couldn't, he had a really hard time catching them. Well, there's, there's two main ways to catch these lizards. One of them was shown in the, um, in the video. We basically get a long fishing pole, and on the end of it, we make a little slip knot, uh, slip knot made out of dental floss. Uh, it's basically a little lasso. And then we maneuver it over the lizard's head, and then we pull it up, and if all goes well, uh, it catches them because the head, the neck is thinner than the head, and we lift them off the surface. They have really strong necks. It, it does not do any damage to them. And so we, we you know, wrangle them, if you will. Uh, I must say, it's, it's a it's challenge. Uh, I, I liken this to fly fishing, where you know fly fisher people are so proud of their matching wits with primitive technology against these fish with a brain that big and, and, uh, and often losing. Well, it's the same thing with these lizards. They outsmart you in so many different ways. Um, I will say I have mentioned this to fly fisher people a number of times, and they look at me with in incredulity, like how I could possibly compare my stupid thing with their <laughs> incredible sport. Uh, they just don't get it, but it's the same thing. Uh, the other way you catch them is at night, because what they do at night is they sleep on the ends of branches or on leaves. And presumably the reason they do that is that any organism you know, like a snake or, or a big spider or something, will, yes, will shake the surface and they'll wake up. And you can do that. You, you shake a branch, they wake up, they jump off. 
a great adaptation, but not well suited against a bipedal animal with a flashlight. And so we walk along, we find the lizard, and they just almost glow against the background. And then you just have to grab it before it wakes up from the, from the light. I think it's a learned skill. <laughs> Red microphone. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Raj Boya. My background is IT, so I'm kind of a layperson when it comes to this area. Uh, fascinating lecture with humor. Thank I really you. liked it. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, I read somewhere that all human beings came from Africa. I would like to know your take on that. And uh, other question is, I understand that this is about you know studying evolution, but based on your findings and uh, you know your understanding, can they be applied anywhere regarding disease prevention or disease treatment in the case of human beings? So. Two very good questions. Let me start with the first one. Uh, scientists have looked at the DNA of people around the world and have inferred uh, the where ancient peoples live based on similarity. And what they find is that pretty clearly, human the human species, Homo sapiens, originated in Africa and then moved out of Africa. The details are, are debated, but moved into Asia and into Europe and eventually around the world. But the genetic data show that Africa clearly was the, the home of our species. And it has this it's without getting too technical, it's the if you look at the evolutionary tree of relationships, the first few branches are all occupied by African people. And so that in, it implies that Africa was the home from which other areas then were, were derived as people moved out. And I would say that's pretty well established at this, at this time. Uh, an interesting side note is the genetic data also show very clearly that humans interbred with Neanderthals in Europe and elsewhere. And um, well, one would suggest that humans and Neanderthals probably should be considered the same species as a result, although many anthro uh, human evolutionary biologists don't like that I, or would disagree with my interpretation. But in any case, it's very clear that the, our species arose in Africa. It's a classic definition of a species, that they're non-interbreeding populations. Yes. So if they interbreed, they're the same species. That sort of. I, that would be my view. There are people who have different perspectives. Well, we don't have time to get into to that. Uh, your second question is uh, the implications for human disease. Well, I mean, there's lots of different implications. And one is that uh, clearly that evolution can occur very rapidly. And that has profound implications for the organisms that make us sick. Uh, you know, the antibiotic resistance and so on is a clear example of of why we need to pay attention to evolution, because if we just throw a drug at, unthinkingly at a, at a microorganism, it's gonna evolve its way around that drug very quickly. And then of course there's COVID, and we've all learned about the strains, and what has kind of been underplayed in all this is the analyses of strain evolution of COVID is classic evolutionary biology. It is evolutionary biologists, biologists who do that sort of work, who've developed the methods to understand how to, how to figure out how strains evolve from each other. And so again, and that, that sort of work had been, been done on flu, on the flu, to, that, that's how people have been predicting how do they make vaccines as they look at the evolutionary tree and with some knowledge they guess, well this branch is the one that's gonna be important this year and so we make the vaccine to that. So evolutionary principles have been very involved in that aspect of uh, human disease issues. Um, those would be the ones that come immediately to mind. Uh, I'm going to throw another question in here, since we're on the subject of disease resistance. I'm sure you know in, in bacteria, <clears throat> disease resistance is often, I'm not sorry, disease resistance, antibiotic resistance, often mediated by lateral gene transfer. And um, it's very interesting that early work on this discovered plasmids. So these little elements that go from bacteria to bacteria, and they actually were collecting the genes that confer resistance to multiple antibiotics onto a single closed circular DNA and transmitting it from one organism to another. And that's how they, the multi-drug resistance got transmitted so rapidly in these microbial populations. So I guess you've done a little bit of sequencing. Have you seen any extra chromosomal elements or? Bacteriophage-like? In, in lizards. In lizards. 
we have not seen that. Um, I would say the sort of work that would be able to detect that in lizards has just been going on in the last few years, um, but I don't think that's been, been seen. I, I'm not sure it's been seen in any vertebrate that I can think of. Um, so I would say no. Okay. But, well, but I figured that was a little premature. Yeah, but you know, it's really. with the technology to do deep sequencing and, and repeated sequencing of many individuals and to monitor populations through time, we're finding out all kinds of things we had no clue about. So who knows? Blue microphone? Yeah. Uh, so another uh, online question from Dave Rabinowitz. He's a PSW member. And uh, following up on one of the earlier questions, uh, his question was given the rapid evolution, how do you meaningfully define what a species is? Well, we touched on that a moment ago. It's a classic uh, debate uh, argument in evolutionary biology circles. The classic definition is a species that um, individuals that can interbreed with each other, can and will interbreed with each other, and can produce fertile offspring are members of the same species, whereas individuals that, that can't or won't are not members of the same species. That's the classic definition, and I won't get into lots of the exceptions or arguments or so on. It turns out it works much better for animals than it does for plants, and it doesn't work at all for asexual organisms or microbes. But for animals, that's the classic idea. Now, I think what the question is asking is, well, if a species is evolving so rapidly, uh, how do you know if you know, when one species turns into another. And of course, this is a difficult question that if you have individuals of two species and they don't interbreed with each other, it's easy to say, well, that's species A and that's species B. But as a species changes through time, it may well be that you couldn't breed with something that occurred 10,000, your ancestor 10,000 years ago, but it's changed, uh, you know, in between. Where's the line? And of course, it's, there's no probably no line where one day the two forms can interbreed and the next day they can, and probably slowly differences arise. So it, it, that is difficult to say due to rapid, ev rapid or to any sort of ra evolution, rapid or slow. Um, but that, I mean, I think that's what we expect by evolution, that one species evolves into another, and it's a not an instantaneous process. Red microphone. Lloyd, Lloyd Mitchell, I'm a member. Um, is your evolution occurring like in sort of two different speeds? One is you have a population which has variability and it's being selected, a particular trait. And then when you have your, you know, isolated populations where you just put two lizards on, they don't have as much variability. So then probably the evolution is being driven by the mutation rate. Very good point. Um, and, and yes, so it is commonly believed that the amount of genetic variability in a population it correlates with the ability to evolve. The more variation, the easier it is to evolve because there's more different variants, if you will. And so that should affect the speed of evolution. And as, you know, that should be in turn correlated probably with population size or history. Uh, you know, a population that was founded by two individuals, even if it's gotten large, will probably have lost some of its variation. So that certainly, it certainly is the case, yes. There is a more complicated issue that I didn't get into, but your question sort of raises the issue that we're doing, we're looking at populations on discrete islands. But in fact, just in the area in the Bahamas where we're working, there are hundreds of these little islands, and then there's a large, the large islands that are covered with lizards, and evolution is occurring on each of these islands, could be in very different directions, but then individuals go back and forth at some rate, and so it's a network. And so the evolution is not just what goes on each island, but how individuals move back and forth and how genes get passed around and so on. There's a name for that, it's called a metapopulation, and it could be very complicated. One could imagine that you have islands with predators and islands without predators, and evolution of those islands will be very different, but then an individual from an island with predators might drift over and get onto the other island and so on. Um, so it, it's, th there's that element to it as well, which could be, we've always talked about studying that, but it would be really complicated, so we never have. Uh, Dia Ahmed, uh, I am a physicist and I am not a member. So it's a question about this African origin. Uh, from where 
in Africa, because I understand that the, in, the Aborigines who live in North Africa are different genetically from, uh, so f from where a human being, but part, do we yes. know? I think we know, I think I don't know. Uh, there's been a lot, of, a lot of work on this, and I, it's a complicated question to get a more precise answer, but I think the experts on this do have, do know that, or at least have uh, ideas about it, but I don't know the answer to that. Sorry. Welcome. Okay, red microphone, and then maybe that'll be the last question, unless I come up with one. Sure. I'm Dean Phillips. Uh, I'm not a member. Um, also not a biologist. So, the, one of the things that you that you seem to point out is that statistically, a whole lot more variation, a whole lot more mutation that you've seen in, in these experiences. The 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 evolution is happening much much faster. What does that say in terms of the number of steps? that we've often been taught as sort of discrete in human evolution from Neanderthals forward compared to what you might expect now. Is this, does it mean that there are a hundred times, a thousand times more steps along the way than we had previously expected or discarded steps or how would you describe that? Well, um, so I think, remember that the differences that I'm talking about as the gentleman behind you pointed out are, are quite small. Whereas the differences, say, between even Neanderthals and humans are usually bigger in, in magnitude. And certainly if we talk about all of human evolution from our, you know, our deep ancestors, they're really big changes. And those changes, you know, uh, crudely speaking, they could occur in two different ways. It could be that, say, the increase in brain size, well, humans in the, going, they make a more extreme example from, you know, the deep ancestors of humans to today, our brains have gotten much, much bigger. One could imagine that, in fact, that's a result of hundreds, thousands of genes, each gene having a little effect, making our brain a little bit bigger, and over time, all of these genes have changed to produce the big differences. And that's probably true in most cases, because most traits, particularly what we call quantitative traits, how big something is or so on, what the, what the precise shape is, are usually determined by many different genes. On the other hand, in some cases, it could be just a discrete mutation causes a very different change. It, it's in theory, one could say, probably not the case that a particular mutation could cause a much bigger brain. Um, and in that, so, so both prob probably operate. My guess is that for big changes and, and for complex structures, like say having eyes, you know, deep in time organisms didn't have eyes. Uh, that's probably many different changes uh, leading to the very different parts that compose an eye. Um, so that, does that answer your question? Sort of, it's as much about the, the expectation of the number of changes along the way, or the number of iterations maybe is a better way to put it that you expect now given the research compared to what, you w what was expected 40 years ago? I see. Um, I th interesting question. I think for a given amount of change, if you found it in a shorter period of time, you might expect that gene, there was fewer genes of larger effect would be easier to accomplish, although, I think that might suggest that might might suggest that as a hypothesis. So you know, if, if, if a change of your leg gets this much longer, if it happened very quickly, well, maybe it was just one mutation that got selected for. Whereas over a long period of time, it might have been 20 mutations, each one in di in different genes selected. Although uh, people who specialize in this sort of thing might say I'm out to lunch on that, but that that's my gut feeling. I don't know if this helps any, but having worked on Drosophila mutations, there are mutations in certain kind of genes in Drosophila that will cause Drosophila to have a double set of wings, a whole bunch of extra segments of one kind or another. It will cause it to have a, a leg growing at where its eye should be. There are these homeobox mutations that cause major changes in the structure of, that, of the animal. And then there are ones that are just purely what we say incremental. So nobody's found one where you evolve an eye where there was no eye before. 
but they do find mutations where you get repetition of very, very large structures or malformations of very large structures from very particular mutations in a particular kind of gene. Genes that basically determine how a whole set of expression, gene expression will occur and you screw that up or you make it happen in the wrong place in the gradient of chemicals that determines this, you get these large, large mutations. I think there's also a thing, there's a punctuated evolution where they say uh, a punctuated equilibrium. equilibrium yes. Well, you go through these periods, we have a lot of change. So uh, maybe when animals are under a lot of stress in an environment and you're selecting, you know, a lot of animals are dying and you're selecting for the few that can survive, and that goes on, and that gets to a point where you have an animal that can survive in that, that environment, and then you go through a period of not much happening evolutionarily. So it's a, right, is that correct? Yes. We have punctuated evolution. So there, there are a lot of really complicated things about how evolution works, or that you can, you can see from looking at these very particular mutations in controlled populations. <clears throat> anyway. I think we're going to wrap it up with that. <laughs> and we're going to thank our speaker. Thank you, Jonathan, very, very much. You're very welcome. Before you go, I guess I guess we'll put the mic down. Before you go, we have a couple of small gifts. Uh, one is uh, a copy of the announcement of the lecture signed by all the members of the general committee. And, and another one is a copy of the Venerable Volume 1 of the Philosophical Society of Washington, covering the first three years of its existence and setting forth the founding members, why they founded it, why they called it what it is, and also, I think the first 45, minutes of the first 45 meetings, which cover a variety of topics, many of which, surprisingly, or maybe not, are still relevant today and discussed today. So thank you very much. Thank it's you. been an entertaining and informative and wonderful talk, and we're very glad that you came here to give it. Well, thank you for inviting me. And before we go, we have a few closing announcements. The next lecture will not be on April 14th. So you heard it here. It's on the website. We're not having a meeting on April 14th. The next meeting will be the 2,476th meeting. It will be on April 28th. I think we're in for a real treat. The speaker will be Amanda Padani of Cal Poly. She will be speaking about Mesopotamian life and findings from the readings of ancient cuneiform tablets, of which there are half a million at least that we have, many of them not yet translated, but I understand GTP is on the case, and pretty soon we'll know what they all say, what they all mean, and we'll have a metaverse where these ancient people will come to life, and we can join them for dinner. Just kidding. Okay. Uh, on the 2,477th meeting, we'll be on, I'm sorry, yeah, 77th meeting will be on May 19th. It will be the annual Joseph Henry Lecture. The topic will be building habitats for other worlds, not just the moon. The speakers will be Daniel Innocente of Blue Apron, Blue Apron, Blue Origin, I keep saying that. <laughs> He's gonna bring us dinner. Eleanor Morgan, Lockheed Martin, Melody Yashar of Icon, and Paul Kessler of NASA. The 2478th meeting will be on June 2nd. The speaker will be Sean Carroll, not the Sean Carroll of HHMI, who made the film that you saw tonight, but the Sean Carroll of Physics, who has published numerous textbooks and also has done a couple of great courses, lecture series. He's at Johns Hopkins presently in the Santa Fe Institute, and he'll be speaking on whatever it says there. Basically, general relativity. The 2479th meeting will complete the spring lecture series on June 16th, and the speakers will be Bill Merrill and Sam Brody of Texas A&M, and they'll be speaking about the Ike Dyke Project. It's a massive infrastructure project to control rising tides and water surges that often damage Houston and threaten to engulf it in the future in flooding and storm damage. 
It's one of the largest civil engineering projects being contemplated, at least in the United States. So please check the PSW website often for up-to-date information on meetings. And before we go, let's thank our crew, Janet Soreth and Rosemary Collins. <laughs> Cameo Lance, how did you say it? Not actually here, what do you call it? Some word, out of her body, I forget. Robin Taylor back there, we never see her, but she was really responsible for making all this video and streaming work. Carrie Bliss, who uh, was not here actually, so we thank Connor Nixon instead, who did the live chat. Connor Nixon, uh, Robert Thompson and Lloyd Mitchell for running the cameras. And Bill Mitchell will do the video editing. So again, let's thank them all. For those of you who have never done any work for the society, we welcome volunteers and certainly would like help uh, loading things up and uh, loading the car tonight. So if you're in a mood to uh, lend a hand, let me know. Otherwise, uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. And a second. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>